welcome to this very special service. Welcome especially to our friends from Scarborough and Stockton and maybe one or two other people. I did wonder if we might be having some visitors who've been gathering for the Elizabeth Gaskell Society meeting in Whitby. 80 of them somewhere in Whitby and two came um, yesterday to have a look around just to visit this chapel that Elizabeth Gaskell probably visited when she was here uh, writing Sylvia's Lovers. And um, they, they were interested and they said they'd mentioned to their friends that the service was at two and they might come. I thought, oh, 80 people. <laughs> How will we handle that? But we haven't had to do and it's, it's lovely, lovely to see you. And a very, very warm welcome to the um, UK Unitarian TV crew Joan and John and Bronwyn and Kevin, we're delighted to, to have them here in our chapel and to be filming us this afternoon. So I will now light our chalice candle. Now is the time for coming together. Here is the place we meet as community. Together, our gatherings makes this time, this place, holy. Let us worship the one who has called us now here together. And we're going to begin by singing hymn 43 in your hymn book, Gather the Spirit, written and composed by Jim Scott, whom I'll be speaking about in the service. Gather the Spirit, harvest the power, our separate fires will kindle one flame. Number 43. Just join together in some moments of prayer and reflection. Spirit, source of life, we open our hearts and minds in prayer 
and meditation to be strengthened and refreshed. We open our hearts and minds to let the healing power of spiritual communion act upon us. Help us to understand the nature of our being, our deepest needs, the importance of the life we live together, our sense of responsibility towards those who depend upon us, the give and take of fellowship, the overcoming of mindless acts with good. Help us to understand the inner significance of all the caring, interest and friendliness which we call love and how it can illumine our lives, how it may create happy relations in every phase of life how it may overcome doubt and fear and give us the inner strength of spiritual well-being and inward peace. Eternal Spirit, we have in our spiritual vision seen something greater, better, more generous and more compassionate than we ourselves often are. And we pray to keep that vision alive within us. Inspire us in our efforts to be more true to that vision of our better selves. And may we help one another to attain the good, the loving and the gracious life in the spirit of all that is best in humanity. Amen. And now I invite you to join with me in saying those words that you'll find in your order of service. These are alternative words written by Leslie McEwen, uh, alternative words to the Lord's Prayer, or as we often say, the Prayer of Jesus. Spirit of life, source of our being, where goodness and creating loving-kindness dwell. Help us to create a better world where all creatures have food, shelter and warmth, remembering our frailties as humans, forgiving others as we forgive ourselves. Let our conscience and reason lead us into paths of goodness and right conduct where our fellowship of love and service to humanity will lighten the darkness of the world forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> and now we will hear a poem written by Walt Whitman, read by Andrew Parkinson, Song of the Open Road. Afoot and light-hearted, I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me. Henceforth, I ask, not good fortune, I ask myself, am good fortune. Strong and content, I travel the open road, I inhale great draughts of space, the east and the west are mine and the north and the south are mine. All seems beautiful to me. I can repeat over to men and women. You can have done such good to me. I would do the same to you. Whoever you are, come travel with me. However sweet these laid up stores, however convenient this dwelling, we cannot remain here. However sheltered this port and however calm these waters, we must not anchor here. Together, the inducements will be greater. We will sail pathless and wild seas. We will go wherever the wind blows. Forward after great companions and to belong to them. They too are on the road, 
onward to this which is an endless as to what was beginningless to undergo much tramps of days rests of nights to see nothing anywhere but what you may reach and pass to look up and down no row but but it stretches and waits for you to know the universe itself as a road as many roads as roads of travelling souls thank you and now we're going to join together in singing another hymn and it's hymn number 16 story that I've chosen is from a collection of Bill Darlison's stories and it may well be a story that you've heard before. It has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the theme of this service but that doesn't matter because I think you'll enjoy it as a story and it does have a sort of moral um, to deliver and it's called Peter's Parrot. Right, well Peter really wanted a pet so he went to the pet shop to have a look round. His eye was immediately caught by a beautiful parrot. I really like the look of that parrot, he said to the pet shop owner. Can it talk? It's a brilliant talker, said the shopkeeper. It has a vocabulary of a hundred words. It will amaze all your friends and it will keep you entertained for hours. How much is it? asked Peter. 50 euros and cheap at the price. Would you like a cage too? Certainly, said Peter. How much? 20 euros. What about a perch? How much? 20 euros. Peter paid the 90 euros and took the parrot, the cage and the perch home. He was very much looking forward to hearing the parrot talk, but it didn't. For 24 hours, it sat on its perch in the cage but apart from an occasional squawk, no sound issued from its beak. So, the next day, Peter returned to the shop. Excuse me, he said to the shopkeeper. I bought a parrot here yesterday, and you told me it was a brilliant talker. But it hasn't said a word yet. How strange, said the shopkeeper. You mean to say that he swung on his little swing and never spoke a word? You never mentioned anything about a swing. Every parrot needs a swing. A parrot won't talk unless it has a swing. How much, asked Peter? 20 euros. Peter bought the swing and fixed it in the cage. The parrot swung merrily all day, but it still didn't talk. Peter went back to the shop. Excuse me, he said to the shopkeeper. I bought a parrot here two days ago. You told me it could talk really well, but it still hasn't said a word. Oh dear, said the shopkeeper. 
You mean that it's been swinging on its little swing and climbing its little ladder and it still hasn't spoken? Wait a minute, said Peter. You never said anything about a little ladder. A parrot needs a ladder. Everyone knows that. A parrot won't talk unless it has a ladder to climb. How much is a ladder? 20 euros. Peter bought the ladder and put it in the parrot's cage. The parrot swung on its swing and climbed on its ladder, but it still didn't talk. Peter returned to the shop. Excuse me, he said, three days ago I bought a parrot. You said that it could talk very well, but it still hasn't said a word. Goodness, said the man. You mean to say that it swung on its little swing, climbed its little ladder, rung its little bell, and it still hasn't spoken? <laughs> you never mentioned a bell. Everyone knows that a parrot won't talk unless it has a little bell to ring. How much? 20 euros. Peter bought the bell, took it home, and fixed it in the cage. The parrot swung merrily on its swing, climbed its ladder and rang its bell. But it didn't talk. In fact, it died. It fell off its perch and landed on the cage floor. It was stone dead. This parrot is dead. Peter went back to the shop, excuse me, he said, four days ago, I bought a parrot which you said could talk very well. I've also bought a cage, a perch, a swing, a ladder and a bell. I spent 150 euros in your shop and this morning the parrot dropped down dead. I'm sorry to hear that. Did he speak before he died? Yes, he did, as it happens. His final and only words were, didn't that stupid money-grabbing shopkeeper say anything about some bird seed? <laughs> <laughs> and now Liz, our chairperson, is going to uh, read from um, Cry Pain, Cry Hope. This is a passage from the writing of Elizabeth O'Connor. It is from her book, Cry Pain, Cry Hope. She was a writer, teacher and counsellor who spent many years working in an inner city neighbourhood in Washington, D.C., helping elderly women. She believed that many of us hear a call in our lives not just those who become ministers. Call, more often than not, is bound up with economic risks and often does not seem prudent to those looking on. A journey is also involved. Call asks that we set out from a place that is familiar and relatively secure for a destination that can only dimly be perceived, that we cannot be at all certain of reaching. So many are the obstacles that will loom along the way. One of the ways to test the authenticity of call is to determine whether it requires a journey. This journey is not necessarily geographical, Although, as in the case of Abraham and Moses, it is not at all unusual for it to involve leaving one's work and home. Whether or not the call involves an outward journey, it always requires an inward one. We need to be delivered from all that binds and keeps the real self from breaking into music and becoming joy to the world. And now we're going to sing together and uh, we're going to sing one of my really favourite hymns in this book. It's 167.
recall 20 years ago when I first began uh, taking services here, uh, being told uh, by a local shop owner uh, that it takes years to be accepted by Whitby people. He'd been here for a number of years um, and still didn't feel as though he really belonged. And in some ways it's probably true that um, Whitby is a more tight-knit community than many. Many families have remained here for generations. Travel links aren't all that good. They're a lot better than they used to be, but they aren't all that good. With the moors on one side and the sea on the other. When Elizabeth Gaskell wrote her novel, uh, Sylvia's Lovers, um, Elizabeth Gaskell, wife of a Unitarian minister in Manchester, um, it, it was set, it set in Whitby, uh, set in Napoleonic times in Whitby, and one of the main characters travels by sea. He has to get to Hartlepool and then on to Newcastle, and he has to travel by sea. That's the quickest way of doing it, rather than by coach and horses. The railway from Middlesbrough to Whitby was built in the mid-1800s. The railway network that provided trains to villages and towns south um, and west of, and north of Whitby came to a standstill uh, in the 1960s when, of course, famously, uh, Dr. Beeching made draconian cuts to railway networks all over the country. And uh, another an aspect of the sort of insularity of Whitby is when you look around the sort of very narrow streets, the, the close-packed communities rising steeply on either side of the River Esk. So this is a close-knit community, even now, I think, to some extent, a close-knit community physically and socially. But it's the sea that has been the lifeblood of this town. And... Um, it's the sea that has had the opposite effect. The sea has made some of its sons and daughters into intrepid explorers. The sea has captured the spirit and, and the imagination and the intelligence of many of its inhabitants. And instead of insularity and close-mindedness, the very opposite has happened. A great restless, urgent um, need to explore and discover the world beyond the confines of this small town has been part of its history and its character. And I do speak with a kind of passion about this. Um, I'm not a Whitby person, but um, I spent a very sizable chunk of my life in Dover, uh, watching ships crossing the, the channel and being very excited uh, by the sense of adventure and discovery that they represented to me as a child. And even now, uh, I'm excited about the sea and all that it represents. Whitby's, as most of us know, Whitby's most famous explorer has to be James Cook, who sailed from Whitby on the Endeavour with its crew of 94, his salt beef and his pickled cabbage, oranges and lemons to stave off scurvy, and on board 17 sheep, Ducks, hens, pigs, and a goat to supply milk. His 12 barrels of powder, round shot, muskets, and pistols. All the detailed information um, about the three famous voyages is documented in my children's old exercise books. Because no self-respecting school child born and bred in and around the area of North Yorkshire would be allowed would be allowed to get through their early schooling without knowing about Captain Cook. They probably didn't know about the Scoresby family, William Scoresby and his son, both sea captains who commanded whaling ships and were Arctic explorers. The father ran away to sea and made his fortune whaling. When he retired after 43 years at sea, he drew up plans for the East Pier here and provided a water pump for general use with an inscription on it saying, water for the use of all, draw and drink, but do not gossip. His son was a stowaway on his father's ship at the age of 10 and became a whaling boat captain at a very early age. 
but he developed a real interest in science, especially meteorology, and then his life changed radically uh, when he took, he had the calling for the church, and he took holy orders and became an Anglican priest. So explorers, um, mariners, shipbuilders, lifeboatmen and fishermen, all drawn by the power and promise of the sea. And this chapel would not exist, it really would not exist, if it wasn't for the generosity of a Whitby sailmaker, Leonard Wilde, who provided the money for it to be built sometime between 1715 and 1718. And I'd love to know more about Leonard Wilde, but it's, it, it, it's quite difficult to find out very much about this man. I have tried. He certainly lived um, at a time of great religious upheaval. He wasn't a member of the Whitby gentry, but he must have been a resourceful man who'd built up a good income from Whitby's seafaring industry and who felt passionately about religious dissent enough to provide the money for this chapel and to bequeath also a farm to the congregation, insisting that the income should be used for the support of a minister. It's very, very unlikely that this chapel would still be here if it hadn't been for the generosity of Leonard Wilde. My title for this service uh, is We Shall Not Cease from Exploration, and comes from one of the four quartets by T.S. Eliot. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. T.S. Eliot uses the image of the voyager at sea as a metaphor for our life's journey. And at the end of the first section of the four quartets, he has these words. Old men ought to be explorers. Here and there does not matter. We must be still and still moving into another intensity for a further union, a deeper communion through the dark, cold and empty desolation. The wave cry, the wind cry, the vast waters of the petrel and the porpoise. I don't know what you would make of those words. Um, he's certainly not a comforting poet. He doesn't cherish romantic illusions about sunset evenings spent on deck in our twilight years. He's certainly not describing a saga luxury cruise. It's colder and it's darker and much less comforting. But exploration is both a challenge and a deep human need. Imagine a child without an inquiring spirit. Imagine our own Unitarian tradition without its restless spirit of exploration. Imagine any one of our churches and chapels without the constant questioning of what we mean by religious truth and the life-threatening risks that people took, and they really were life-threatening risks. They took those risks in times past when uh, they questioned religious authority. Think of the words of Walt Whitman that Andrew read for us earlier, who was deeply influenced by the American transcendentalists in Song of the Open Road. He says, however sheltered this port and however calm these waters, we must not anchor here. Together, the inducements will be greater. We will sail pathless and wild seas. We will go where winds blow. Whitman was influenced by Emerson, who had a lot to say about the deadening hand of conformity. If we want to live fully, we can't stay still in the beliefs of yesterday. That's what exploration means. The freedom to move out towards deeper understanding of ourselves and the world we live in and the people we live with. Sometimes it can be very dangerous. We lose our bearings and take risks. 
But risk is at the heart of true exploration. Every sailor, every sea captain, every member of a lifeboat crew who sailed from this harbour knows about risk. And we too know about risk, though often we will say we are risk averse. I say I am a risk averse person by and large. I like to consider all my options um, before I make a move. Um, you know, and I've been known to put up the barricades, feeling a bit smug and self-satisfied. But I think mostly I've been saved by a kind of restlessness that breaks through. And I can usually rely on it uh, to jostle me out of complacency and get me thinking and feeling uh, a new way about something and being a bit more adventurous. And I suppose that's my kind of exploration. And it doesn't have much to, to do, it doesn't have to have much to do with traveling um, physically, but it is the kind of exploration that, as Elizabeth O'Connor puts it in the reading Liv, Liz gave us, always requires an inward journey. I think that's what T.S. Eliot meant when he says, we shall not cease from exploration. He uses the metaphor of sea travel with all its perils. He doesn't believe in the idea of autumnal serenity. His poetry challenges us to be alive and awake and to take risks because, as he says, the pattern is new in every moment and every moment is a new and shocking evaluation of all we have been. The journey may be a physically outward journey, but it will always be an inward journey too. And let me just finish with some recent news. I cut this out of the paper for my, my grandson because I was so excited about it. NASA's spacecraft passed Pluto last Tuesday. It was carrying the ashes of Clyde W. Tombaugh, the astronomer who discovered the planet Pluto in 1930 at the age of 24. He was also the co-founder of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Las Cruces in New Mexico. Clyde W. Tombaugh found a planet and founded a church. That's some achievement. And now, shall we just join once again in some moments of prayer and reflection? We go forward in the spirit of goodwill, welcoming those who share our journey. We look back with gratitude for what our community of faith has given us, a meeting place for laughter and tears, for joy and sadness, a meeting place for both agreement and dissent. We go forward in love, knowing that all community provides a mixture of comfort and conflict, knowing that we have times of struggle and sometimes need to wait to understand ourselves and each other better. We look back, cherishing companionship and loyalty, knowing that even throughout difficult times there have been those to support us. We go forward in hope, with mind and hearts awake to the possibilities of what we are able to do together. Spirit of light and love, let our togetherness be a blessing to the spirit of this chapel. Amen. And now our last hymn is hymn one, two, four. One more step, we will take one more step. One, two, four.
without vision, people perish. As we leave this place of vision, may we not be overwhelmed by the task nor undervalue the part we can play. In the days ahead, may we have the courage, strength and concern to keep learning and sharing as we seek larger living for all. Amen. Amen. Do we stay?